let me warmly welcome you all uh, who are connected today uh, to join Renew uh, in its uh, webinar dedicated to a question of uh, philanthropy, non and uh, not for profit organization in Europe, and how to unleash the uh, potential of uh, public good. The Treaty of Lisbon provides uh, for a right of, uh, uh, to freedom or, or of peaceful assembly and to freedom of uh, uh, association at all levels, uh, in particular in political, trade union, and civic matters uh, for the protection of uh, his or her uh, interests. However, while it's uh, relatively easy across the EU to pursue a freedom of assembly for an economic reason, uh, for commercial enterprises, this is not always the case for aligning the work uh, for the benefit of common good, for the protection of minority rights, research or COVID uh, actions, uh, if, we, if you will. Already in uh, 1987, uh, of the Fontaine report on nonprofit make, making uh, associations in the European community recommended to explore a legal framework for a European status for European associations. It is also not unusual to see foundations that work on cross-European scale, although they traditionally were active regionally. Uh, the globalization uh, of the economy has had some influence on the foundation sector uh, as well. The number of foundations, founders, uh, and donors already engaged in cross-border activities has grown significantly over the last decade. I can think, for example, of uh, at least three German uh, foundations operating in my country, Bulgaria. So the current decision tries to look ahead into a direction of one of the most fundamental principles of any law system, that of legal clarity. Today's panel would look into the hurdles uh, in that regard, both from a legal and a financial perspective later in the second uh, uh, panel chaired by my uh, very much valued colleague, uh, Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, Nicola Bier. A lot of questions remain answered uh, with uh, regard to the path, uh, pathwork of, of national rules for establishment, non-profit status or uh, the dissolution, as well as uh, on the decentralized supervision, take, uh, tackling tax evasion practices and uh, jurisdiction uh, shopping. The questions remain also as uh, to the right way to achieve the balance between all uh, of the above. Would the most appropriate way forward uh, be through more harmonized provisions for uh, additional formal association? Uh, should this goal be achieved by enhanced cooperation or we can think about even uh, by, by mutual recognition? Foundations, trusts, corporate uh, funders, non-for-profit non organizations, associations, and other uh, philanthropic institutions all have uh, in common that they have their own financial resources, uh, which they deploy in accordance with uh, respective purpose laid down in, in their status, uh, statuses, uh, using private resources for, for public good, for example. Uh, let me refer to the foundations uh, hereafter to, to simplify my intervention. Uh, fortunately, even here, we hit the wall of uh, uncertainty as there is no universal European legal definition of foundation, and it can mean uh, something very different from uh, one member state to a state to another, mainly due to the different uh, cultures and different legal and uh, fiscal provisions. In the 27 member states, quite some civil and administrative uh, law differences can be found. Uh, in a significant number of the countries, uh, state approval is needed for foundations to be established in mostly non-discriminatory uh, manner. Uh, in so far, the legal requirements are met. The registration is done with local, uh, with local or, or state authorities in some member states or by uh, courts in, in others. Except for, for trust, usually foundations have legal uh, personality, which are also recognized across uh, European Union, if uh, validly formed in accordance with the laws of, uh, of one uh, member state. However, the real C doctrine, uh, where applied typically requires a foundation not only to have a in the state of uh, formation, but also 
uh, its principal uh, place of business. Uh, to further complicate the situation, foundations might have, have uh, assets in several countries, uh, which uh, may become part of the foundation's endowment and require a diversified asset uh, administration in several uh, member states. Uh, fundraising may, may be undertaken in uh, several countries too. There are also different uh, perspectives and regimes regarding the permitted engagement in economic activities uh, of uh, non-for-profit organizations, its supervision and obligations, such as uh, financial reporting and etc. cetera. Uh, however, in the context uh, we operate at the moment, the importance of foundations is the area of research uh, should be underlined, as they do not only grant funds to institutions, but also exercise significant research uh, themselves. And this does not only happen with one member state, uh, but uh, across borders, as COVID-19 has not stopped at the borders, but requires a joint European uh, effort, legal uncertainty in the development of uh, transnational research funding uh, by foundation needs to be tackled uh, if we want to create European uh, autonomy and to compete at international level. All of these aspects requires a closer look uh, in, in order to overcome uh, uncertainty uh, and barriers uh, that we have created, uh, which is essential if you want to unleash the potential of uh, philanthropic uh, entities for uh, the public good and get the mechanism to balance independence accountability uh, in a very right way. Bearing in mind that uh, there is a potential for further growth in the philanthropic sector in uh, Europe. And the upcoming uh, legislative initiative report in the uh, Legal Affairs Committee, uh, a, state, uh, a status uh, for, for European cross-border association and non-profit organizations uh, for which uh, I would be the Renew uh, Europe uh, Group Shadow Rapporteur will allow us to particular to analyze the benefits of the establishment of the European Foundation in parallel to national legal structures, possibly in, 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 very, in very similar way uh, to the society, societies Europe, Europe uh, with uh, optional use for foundations which uh, wish to engage uh, Europe-wide and, and cross-border. Uh, to this extent, we have already required a study to be presented to the uh, committee in, uh, in due time. Uh, let me move uh, slowly to the to the uh, next uh, to the next speakers. Uh, given that, uh, from the economic perspective, uh, associations and foundations are often considered to to be important uh, building blocks in the in the third sector or, or social economy, if you prefer. Uh, which is why I have the pleasure to give uh, the floor uh, to our first speaker from from DG Grow. Uh, Dr. Rua Engelman, Head of uh, Unit for uh, Social Economy. Uh, please, Madam, you have the floor for 10 minutes uh, to give us the perspective of the European uh, Commission. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of the European Parliament, I'm delighted uh, to intervene today during this webinar prepared by Renew Europe on such an important topic. And as you also said, the global COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the fragility and interdependency of our economic ecosystems. It has exposed the vulnerabilities of individuals, societies and economies, and therefore a calling for rethinking how economic and social activities are organized. It calls for strong responses based on solidarity, cooperation and responsibility. And let me begin by mentioning that in this time of crisis, the role of philanthropy in the wave of solidarity was visible more than ever before. And European philanthropy's response to the COVID-19 crisis was tremendous and timely. The massive social and economic disruption surrounding the pandemic has caused philanthropic foundations to redirect funding for emergency response and post uh, recovery. So with this, through not prepared for emergency situations, the foundations across Europe, from large organizations to community foundations, 
mobilized quickly to step up and provide support at both national and European levels. Indeed, non-for-profits and NGOs are facing unprecedented challenges also due to the pandemic because they are under pressure with the delivery of services or they had to shift to remote work. So dedicated support has never been so much needed. And the philanthropy sector has demonstrated social commitment to the public good and active citizenship. We all know that several attempts to push the European Statute for Foundation did not have the success we wished for. I'm fully aware that cross-border philanthropy remains a challenge since the definition of public benefit foundations largely differ in Europe. This leads to registration problems, hurdles to shift headquarters between within the EU and perform cross-border mergers. And this costs time and money. Legislative solutions are hard to find since unanimity is required in the Council, for which political reasons is difficult to achieve. However, I clearly think it is key to continue to push for a European philanthropy market. Institutional philanthropy in Europe includes more than 147,000 philanthropic organizations with an accumulated annual giving of nearly 60 billion. Besides funding and investment, these organizations combine an outstanding set of expertise, deep knowledge and excellent stakeholder networks in the area of their activities. And this can be leveraged significantly with the appropriate framework conditions. Therefore, it is important to mention that we are carefully following the work on your own initiative report entitled a statute for European cross-border associations and non-profit organizations. And from our side, we have also commissioned a cross-border cooperation of social economy, including the specific role of foundations. You have also mentioned the study, so it will also be interesting then to see and uh, compare our studies and uh, get the best argument out of our studies. We are eager to understand best practices that allow social economy enterprises to make the most out of the single market and also to know what are the obstacles which hinder their expansion. Our study will be available in the second half of 21 in this process will be the European Action Plan on Social Economy and that will be released in the second semester 21 to stimulate the development for the sector and Commissioner Schmidt has been invited to work on this issue and after the social business initiative this will be a renewed engagement from the Commission to foster the third sector and social economy. And my team is currently working in close relations with DG Employment to deliver, may it be on liaising and discussing with stakeholders or on preparing our conference on social economy, which is called the European Social Economy Summit in May, where we want to reflect on new ideas for the development of the sector. And it speaks for itself that this will also push the interest of many European foundations. Let me focus on the role of the EU funds to leverage the action of philanthropy. In the MFF, InvestEU will play a particular role, particularly under the social window. Innovative financial instruments and opportunities for foundations will be possible via the design of co-grant and co-investment schemes. And the MFF is indeed a great tool to engage different parties in smart funding operations that need to address societal challenges. And next to the MFF, of course, we have the next generation EU, which will also have opportunities. And we see clear possibilities for member states to work in close cooperation with the foundations on the recovery, promoting investment linked to our European priorities and in line with our country specific recommendations. And therefore, we are currently evaluating this national reform plans and we are 
seeing that some member states are eager to push social economy as a key element of their recovery strategy. And therefore, considering the flagship of recovery and resilience facility, we see clear opportunities for social housing and up and reskilling. These are two areas where foundations have already much experience. And to finish, I would like to mention that boosting private investment and grants for the public good cannot be achieved without the full participation of citizens. Indeed, philanthropy aims to bring about society centered on social cohesion, active citizenship, fulfillment and equal opportunities. Many of us are triggered by indigation at injustice, care for the most vulnerable, aspiration for an innovative future and the responsibility for preserving valuable nature and culture. And therefore, the citizen involvement and partnerships with the sector are very important to relaunch the economy, but also to support resilience, democracy and our European values. And philanthropy is very well placed to act as intermediaries in designing policies with citizens. And therefore, the European Commission will continue to promote these European values in respect for our rule of law here at the heart of our union. And I know I can trust philanthropy to defend these ones as well and investing in areas that do not generate profit but serve the needs of communities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Engelmann, for your valuable contribution. Uh, we'll come back to uh, some of your thoughts uh, as well, where you try to uh, rightly link the philanthropy and uh, citizens' uh, uh, participation. But now I would like to give the floor to my, my colleague, uh, Anna Donat, uh, representing the perspective of the New Europe uh, Group in Civil uh, Rights, uh, Justice and, and Home Affairs Committee. Uh, Anna, you, you, you may uh, take the uh, different look, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, you're going to uh, uh, look specifically into foreign uh, uh, fund, funding restrictions uh, for uh, not-for-profit organizations. You have Indeed. the floor. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really pleased to be among you. Uh, it's one of the most important from my perspective, it's something I'm really um, uh, attached to as myself. I'm coming from the civil society. So let me start with to say that I believe that civil society is one of the beating hearts of our European values. And it uh, may sound like a cliche, but a vibrant civil society is one of the indicators of a healthy democracy. European civil society has been continuously in capacity to bring real change to actually help improve people's life, promote new ideas and new ways of addressing our common often global challenges. Yet it is still confined into national context and national regulation. The legal, linguistic, administrative and financial hurdles that this entails has a deterrent effect on the development of cross-border or EU level activities and scaling up. Cross-border donations are cumbersome and uh, often results in disputes with national authorities and this discourages uh, the practice, although there is so much potential in it. Therefore, it is time that we unleash this potential and uh, strike down these barriers. But not only uh, is there an enabling environment. In many European countries, civil uh, space is shrinking or being deliberately shrunk. Uh, Orban's Lex NGO is the example of an EU government deliberately shrinking civil space. Um, Orban's Lex NGO was borrowed from Putin's playbook and under the pre uh, pretense of achieving more transparency, it aims at stigmatizing critical NGOs and portraying them as enemies of the state. The law also had a significant chilling effect on the entire sector and discouraged cooperation with critical NGOs, many of which uh, do recent funds from a variety of sources outside Hungary. We and many others claimed from the outset that this is a gross violation of this organization's freedom of association. And this is what the European Court of Justice confirmed in its ruling last year. Uh, ECJ 
striking down retraining that limitation on foreign funding violate free movement of capital and the principle of non-discrimination, but it went even further. It also found that because it was the scope of free movement of capital, the charter also applied and hence Lex NGO infringes freedom of association too. I believe that court rulings help, but we need positive action as well. So in my view, we cannot indefinitely rely on uh, the court of justice because it can rule only law and judgments take a very long time. Uh, though a discussion needs to be had on fostering strategic li litigation and the more systematic use of interim measures. The work ahead of us is complement funding support with an enabling environment and legal protection. In late 2020, we put pressure and secured increasing EU financial support for civil society organizations through the Rights and Values program. This was the result of years of substantial cooperation with civil society and the European Parliament showing how strong we can be when, when speak with one uh, united voice. Now it is time to complement this with legal protection and a truly enabling environment for civil society organizations at the EU level. Yet, uh, yes, uh, previously attempts to establish statute for EU association have failed, but the context is changing. The potential for cross-border work is growing as common challenges and increasingly recognized throughout Europe. Issues such as the rule of law or uh, the environment, the response to crisis are transcending national borders and public debate is starting to spread beyond the domestic political air arena. We must now uh, uh, find ways to complement this financial support with legal protection and truly an uh, enabling environment for civil society organizations. Imagine if we could protect, provide a genuine EU level protection to association and give genuine meaning to the protection of freedom of association. Um, and why not imagine that we do away with barriers to cross border donations that any EU citizen can easily use test schemes in a, in a member state to help the work civil society organization in other member states. If we can't secure an EU-wide from the outset, let's start with the coalition of the willing and first consider enhanced cooperation. This would already foster cross-border work and the emergence of European public sphere. It would also provide a safe Net for those CSOs operating and participating countries, for instance, to avoid the kind of attacks Hungarian NGOs are exposed to right now. Furthermore, uh, it would demonstrate that an organization does not need to do cross-border work to, the, to, to bring very important European added value. Meanwhile, the rewards, I believe, are high. Being regulated at the European level, the organization's question would be automatically covered by the, uh, the Charter's provisions. Cross-border civic work would definitely be fostered and this would contribute to reinforcing EU citizenship, transnational dialogue and of an EU public sphere and could also help organize participation of civil society in EU decision making. I also argue that activities may not have to be cross-border per se. Many NGOs work have a very strong European added value. When a European Commission relies on watchdog NGOs to contribute to the annual rule of law report, aren't these organizations performing uh, work with a European dimension by monitoring the rule of law? We had examples of statutes uh, proposed by the Commission where cross-border activities was not required from the outset. Similarly, an NGO can start working in one country and decide to, to export its best practice or model. The statute would boost this. Why limit them? Imagine cultural initiatives in border regions. Why slow them down with complicated administrative burdens? They should be able to start working in one country and then spread on the other side of the border easily uh, if their initiative works. Or imagine grief initiatives around natural landmarks. Wouldn't cross-border fundraising in itself already constitute a European activity? I believe many other questions have to be discussed and we have a lot of work ahead of us, but one thing is sure, we will have a lot to convincing to do so at national and EU level as well. And this is why I believe we must speak with one voice, MEPs, NGOs, associations, foundation, and all other civil society organizations together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. Um,
you emphasized uh, one more time how important is the cooperation between MEPs, MPs, and civil society. Uh, but also, you reiterate the big hurdles that we have uh, ahead of us and in front of us. Uh, thank you once again for, for this intervention. Uh, and now I'm moving uh, on with, with our panel. Uh, would like to, to hear more the voice of uh, stakeholders. Um, and I think they are, they are the most um, affected, uh, but also uh, they should be the, the most vocal in, in this process. And um, I'm happy to announce that uh, we have uh, uh, Madam Brikena uh, Jomachi, jo jo uh, who will represent the civil society uh, Europe, and uh, she will give us an overview on the experience of civil society organizations associations and NGOs. Uh, Madam, you have uh, 10 minutes for your intervention. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, uh, members of the parliament. And uh, I congratulate you uh, for this work and on a very important issue. And uh, good afternoon to all the other speakers as well. And I'm happy that uh, Anna spoke before me because she indeed highlighted some of the main issues very well. So I don't need to repeat them and I will just try to bring my perspective to the topic, uh, given the, um, the experience of civil society organizations and I represent here civil society Europe, which is an umbre umbrella organization that gathers uh, many EU wide networks, civil society associations that work uh, on EU uh, policy making and that bring together many national, regional and local NGOs. So I would like to highlight three points that I think are very important and then try to bring also some examples of barriers that we face when it comes to this issue. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we need you to put in place and support the conditions for an enabling civic space like it was mentioned and guaranteeing freedom of associations, expression and assembly within Europe and across border and transnationally. Uh, and key element of the EU project, uh, freedom of capital, services and movement must be also guaranteed to civil society organizations promoting and working for the public good. And I think another important point is the legal uncertainties linked to their activities in social market economy that should be lifted. Now, we have been fighting as associations since the 80s on this issue, and we have been working with the Alliance for the Status of European associations uh, on this particular uh, legal framework. Uh, in Europe, civil society organizations, um, both associations and foundations, like it was mentioned by you, uh, are facing many uh, challenges to, that prevent them from operating uh, on their best intentions. Furthermore, the civic space for civil society organizations so shrinking, which makes this heartless even more significant. And specifically, two are the main issues at hand. First, what was mentioned is the absence of a legal status for civil society organizations, which would allow them to operate, to operate across borders in other EU countries, such as recruiting members, being able uh, to set up a branches, to acquire donations, etc. The other issue is more globally, the absence of a legal framework definition of associations, NGOs and civil society organizations. The EU uh, must acknowledge the existence, I mean, it does acknowledge, for example, the existence of enterprises and bodies of public authorities, but not for associations, non-profit organizations, which do not belong to these categories. Some of the examples that I want to bring to your attention are, first of all, the recognition of a legal personality. Associations and both foundations sometimes need to register or create a branch before they are able to operate in another EU country. Uh, the legal personality is not always recognized uh, abroad. Some member states require special registrations process or event in order for foreign foundations to be able to operate in their territory. Another issue is the cross-border merger or transfer of a seat. I don't know how aware you are of the many difficulties that associations are facing when they, for example, have been established in a EU uh, country and then they have moved to another. Uh, very often it happens for associations that have moved from, I don't know, let's say, uh, Sweden, Netherlands, France or Sweden, Estonia, and then they wanted to create a branch 
in Brussels to be closer to the EU institutions, for example. So you can imagine the degree of bureaucracy and the difficulties uh, of doing so. Um, another issue is also cross-border donations that it was mentioned. Associations could benefit farther from these donations from individuals and donors that are residing in other EU countries. However, there are still the rules in place uh, which provides um, uh, which provide that not resident donors are denied of uh, all uh, or some tax benefits available to the residents or make the procedures more complex to obtain them in practice. So this discourages cross-border donations, of course, and it was also mentioned. And the last point uh, of a barriers that I would like to mention that was, of course, already mentioned as well, was the restriction on uh, foreign funding, where philanthropic funding should flow freely according to the EU principle of freedom of movement uh, of, uh, or free movement of capital within the internal market. There is a new worrying phenomenon, the so-called uh, foreign funding, foreign agents and restrictions, which affects the possibility of associations and NGOs to diversify the sources of funding in a context where public funding becomes so scarce and also private funding is affected by the pandemic. On many areas, from funding to uh, issues related to the state aids, procurement, uh, civil society organizations are also not recognized as a key actor uh, with its own specificities. Uh, civil society organizations are the third employer in Europe, according to the recent EU-funded uh, study, Third Sector Impacts, uh, that was conducted. And associations and NGOs also mobilize a lot of volunteers. Uh, in, uh, in Europe, one out of five Europeans mobilizes in civil society organizations. Imagine the number of people we are speaking about. A legal political framework would remove current uh, uncertainties to their activity in social markets uh, economy next to the traditional companies. Also, um, in areas such as money laundering or financing terrorism, EU authorities do not always know how to deal with the non-profit associations and foundations and, uh, as legislation is fitted for profit uh, actors only uh, and does not work well with associations and foundations working for the public goods. Uh, so for us, two options are uh, really to be kept in mind, that is uh, to create this legal frame framework, but if a political agreement is to be found for this, it must be flexible. Uh, it will to allow for both advocacy, um, watchdog and service provision and not to create red tape, but also to respect the diversity of the sector, as you can imagine how diverse the sector is that sometimes even ourselves, we have troubles uh, navigating in the diversity. So I really think this is something that it's of course makes the work of the, of the institutions much harder, but that diversity is also our richness, so we need to keep that in mind. And I think the second option is that legal provisions must be put in place so as to remove the hardness to cross border activities of associations. We have seen, for example, just to name a, a concrete example of issues with, with, uh, with this is the volunteers. When we recruit volunteers or uh, when we have uh, volunteering contracts, uh, sometimes we have people of, of different nationalities, so sometimes EU citizens, sometimes non-EU citizens, and they have so many big troubles in being able to be volunteers of a particular association in a particular country, just because of different uh, employment uh, frameworks that exist in every member, um, member state. And the status also of volunteers is a major issue linked to this as well. So I think I, I, will, I will close with this and and uh, I hope this can, can help the discussion. Of course, we are also uh, very uh, able to provide more written uh, examples and more uh, written contributions to your work. But I would like to thank you very much for taking this uh, question into, into your work and, and working on this issue because we, we really uh, are very much uh, committed to, to move this forward. We are also working uh, within the civil society Europe, but also with the European Social Economic Committee, which is also having a particular group uh, working on this, uh, on this issue, which I think uh, the links between these different uh, should be brought together and somehow we can cooperate and, and help each other. So thank you very much again for having me and thank you for uh, the, the topic. Thank you for your thoughts. Indeed, uh, we'll continue our cooperation and collaboration in the future. It's, it's more than ever. Uh, it's, it's more than ever. It's part of our uh, agenda 
and we'll keep you very busy in this uh, in this process. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Uh, Eleonora uh, Insawako, Head of uh, Intercultural Research and Programming of the Euro Mediterranean uh, Annalyn Foundation, which focuses its work uh, on finding the mistrust and polarization between societies. Very important topic, especially uh, nowadays, introducing inter uh, national policy making research with focus so, to inclusive uh, societies and I'm, I'm repeating inclusive societies and fighting uh, intolerance also a very important topic uh, so uh, you have the floor madam thank you very much uh, so honorable members of the european parliament your excellencies ladies and gentlemen first of all good afternoon I really would like to thank the European Parliament for uh, the invitation to the Annalyn Foundation to this uh, session that is uh, tackling a very important uh, issue, philanthropy, the work of uh, uh, civil society NGOs. And uh, I would like to share the experience of, of the Annalyn Foundation with its uh, peculiarities in comparison to, um, to the work that uh, you are trying also to establish and promote at the EU level. So the Annalyn Foundation uh, was established in 2005, is officially registered in Egypt as an international intergovernmental institution. And uh, it was uh, registered with the uh, uh, with the pre presidential decree uh, of uh, the Minister uh, uh, of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Egypt in 2005. The foundation uh, was created on 30 November 2004 by the sixth Conference of Ministers of Foreign Affairs of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, who approved its statutes, and the foundation became operational in 2005 with uh, its international headquarters in Alexandria, Egypt, and uh, today it has a staff body of around 30 people. The Annalyn Foundation is the first uh, institution created in the framework of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, the Barcelona process, uh, launched in 1995 for the promotion of a closer political, economic, uh, social and cultural relations across the Euro-Mediterranean region. Uh, after the attacks of September uh, the 11th and the increasing uh, social and uh, cultural tensions in Europe, uh, the Euromed region and globally, uh, the then president of the European Commission, uh, Romano Prodi, issued a report uh, based on the contribution of a high level uh, expert group for the promotion of intercultural dialogue. This is the founding document uh, of the Annalyn Foundation. It, it presents its uh, rationale, its objectives and, and uh, the main activities uh, the foundation should be uh, working on. So the Annalyn Foundation was conceived as the institution to promote intercultural dialogue, uh, facilitate exchanges, work on research and advocacy, and also fund uh, cross-border uh, cross, cross border, um, cooperation projects uh, across the Euro-Mediterranean region. Uh, its statutes uh, underline the vital importance of ensuring that all partners uh, encourage the development and the deepening of the cultural and human dimension of the Euromed partnership in all its aspects uh, and its various components uh, at the bilateral and multilateral level. I would like to share with you some information related to the governance, funding and operations of, of the foundation. So in relation to uh, the governance, uh, the foundation has a board of governors that uh, consists uh, of representatives of the ministries of foreign affairs of all, of all its uh, member countries. So currently uh, we have 41 representatives in our board of governors that are the countries of the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, the role of the board is to uh, appoint the executive director and president of the foundation, as well as the board adopts uh, the multi-annual work program of the foundation, uh, annual work plan, budget, and um, of course the financial uh, reports and, and statements. Another body of the the foundation is uh, the advisory council uh, that consists of 18 personalities uh, also um, nominated by the board of governors and the role of the advisory council is to uh, advise the board of governors the executive director as well as the national networks on the strategic uh, policy orientations of the of the foundation and finally the third uh, body of the foundation is its uh, uh, network of networks indeed the foundation works uh, um, as a network of uh, civil society organizations uh, present in all the uh, member countries so currently our civil society network accounts around over 4000 organizations 
these are NGOs, uh, cultural institutes, uh, um, also private uh, foundations, um, research uh, research centers. In each country, we have a coordinator uh, that is also uh, endorsed by the MFA in each country that uh, has the role of coordinating all these organizations member of the network at the national level. And the foundation has this overall coordinating uh, role and mobilizing role of civil so the civil society organizations members of its network and uh, uh, according to our statutes we must organize at least once per year a meeting uh, an, a general assembly of uh, the national coordinators uh, in relation to the funding the foundation uh, the alf funding uh, derives from grants from of uh, by the european commission and by uh, and from the voluntary contributions of the uh, member states we are currently in our phase five of, uh, of operation, so and this covers the period between 2018 uh, 2021. So just to give you an idea, we have 61% of our funding deriving from three different uh, grants signed with the European Commission and the rest from uh, member state contributions for an amount of around 17 uh, million uh, euros. Uh, the ALF has a bank account uh, in, uh, in Egypt to receive uh, the financial contributions and it is uh, at the discretion of each of the donors uh, to request or not a specific agreement to be signed uh, with, uh, uh, with the Annalind Foundation. Uh, for the financial transactions, uh, the foundation enjoys the uh, privileges um, stipulated in the host country agreement signed with the um, government of, of Egypt. So accordingly, there is no income tax that the foundation has to pay to the Egyptian government. We must pay <coughs> only uh, payroll tax um, in relation to our employees and social security tax for still the employees, um, the Egyptian employees. And then there is another tax that is called the withholding tax to be paid to uh, Egypt-based um, service providers. Periodic financial reports uh, shall be provided to our board of governors um, on all the administrative costs and expenditures. In, uh, in relation to our action, uh, the foundation um, ha develops its activities around the four main programming pillars uh, and that are uh, research and advocacy, uh, capacity building and intercultural cities, uh, Euromed networking and financial support to civil society, partnership building and institutional, institutional development. Uh, I would like to share with you some further information on the cross-border funding uh, provided by the Annalind Foundation that is mainly provided through our uh, funding scheme, our call for proposal funding scheme. Uh, so since our establishment in 2005, we have disbursed around 27 million euros to fund the civil society and funded 324 Euromed projects through this uh, granting scheme. Um, the, the call for proposal uh, is based on the Annaline Foundation, of course, priority fields and uh, for the development of a Euromed cooperation. So each project is based uh, at least on the partnership between one uh, European and one Southern Mediterranean partner country um, civil society organization. Uh, the most recent call for proposal uh, was launched in 2020 with a total financial envelope of 1,700,000 euros uh, for grants ranging between 35,000 and 50,000 uh, euros. Uh, and also we have launched a smaller funding scheme to support the Euromed research projects to, to pilot these uh, Euromed research projects um, for projects between 20,000 and 30,000 euros. Just to give you an example of the kind of projects that we uh, support, uh, um, I would mention one that uh, is called the Translation Collider, led by a Bulgarian-based uh, uh, organization, Next Page Foundation, uh, in partnership with an Egyptian and a Turkish organization. Um, this project um, was uh, based on the promotion of translation, uh, since on the basis of research, uh, literary translations from most languages spoken in the Balkan Peninsula into Arabic um, 
are next to absent, uh, while classical and religious texts translated into the other direction, uh, so from Arabic into the Balkan uh, languages, uh, prevail. Um, the reason, according to uh, the project leaders, lies in the absence of um, literary translators who are capable to translate directly from the languages concerned and uh, act as uh, intercultural uh, mediators. So this project uh, tried to address this, uh, this issue on translation across the Mediterranean. Another project led by a Spanish organization uh, together with uh, Dutch, uh, Greek, Italian and Estonian NGOs um, aimed at the promotion of intercultural citizenship education with the organization of uh, different activities as uh, living libraries, so whereby people were the books telling their, their stories. So with the aim of fighting xenophobia, uh, Islamophobia, uh, racism, through the stories of, uh, of people. And the last example I would like to share is uh, a project led by our uh, um, German civil society that uh, aimed to create a closer relationships between the local populations, uh, refugees and migrants within, within the neighborhood. This project aimed especially to use artistic performances as a way to engage and promote exchanges between um, different people in the neighborhood and in different cities in, in Germany. These are only three examples of our cross-border um, funded projects. Um, this is uh, to give you some ideas on, on the work that we do and on the legal and financial structure of the foundation and so if uh, you would like to hear more i'm here thank you very much for this opportunity thank you so much for your valuable input uh, certainly uh, we are very much interested from uh, your uh, tremendous work and uh, we see a great potential uh, to cooperate in the future we have roughly uh, 15 minutes uh, to finish our uh, first session but uh, uh, we have a q a session coming and uh, what i see from our live chat they are directed some uh, some questions to uh, to our to our panel uh, and the first one is is going to to the to the commission i believe uh, saying that the draft report uh, is uh, <clears throat> has not been uh, presented but uh, uh, of course, uh, we kick. We expect uh, uh, the work to kick off, uh, 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 and uh, at around end of uh, April, beginning of May. And we also hear that the, the good, the good news coming from from the commission. At least the positive uh, news uh, coming from the commission. And the question is related to the <clears throat> European status for non non for profit organization. Uh, that some national governments raise uh, is regards the uh, existence of uh, proven need for establishing of a, such an additional legal form, claiming the current legal system would uh, significantly, significantly allow European citizens of other member states to participate in uh, each other's civil society. What is the view of the Commission in, in that regard? And, uh, uh, what is the approach in which you see most benefit and added value? Uh, Dr. Uh, Engelmann, uh, would, you, would you be uh, able to, to answer this question? I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, you have uh, a, good answer to, a good answer to that. Thank you very much uh, for this question. And um, it is, of course, it is a difficult topic. Uh, last, uh, it, it will, uh, as we had also several speakers have mentioned it, uh, the question of the unanimity uh, to, to pass uh, the, the statute uh, in, in the council and the experience which has been made. But we also see that there are changes, that there are other needs, that the whole situation evolves. And also there is then the importance to see what can be done because uh, there is of course let's say optimal what we were maybe wishing for but then on a more pragmatic way what what can be done and there i think it is very good to have examples of where it works and using example where it works then to help other cases and that's why what you have mentioned, the study and, and our study, where we are looking for barriers uh, in the cross-border uh, cooperation, 
but we have also asked for best practices because you can also learn a lot by best practices and then extrapolate what you have learned from there and apply it. It will probably always depend on the member state context, meaning which cross-border member state uh, links you will have. So of course, the, aim, the ultimate aim, and I guess that's probably also part of uh, what uh, the, the report uh, coming out uh, from, from the European Parliament, we also have to see in which direction this report goes and then work together on, on a uh, correct answer and, and next steps. But I think already the fact that we are entering this dialogue, that we are examining together what are the issues, that brings us already a step further. And from our side, you see also the, the willingness to, to engage. And um, what I have mentioned uh, is uh, this meeting, uh, the European Social Economy Summit in Mannheim in May. And as you said, your studies would be coming out um, around this time. So this might be also uh, because this will be a very big social economy uh, meeting. And we might, uh, I'm not really in a, in a brainstorming mode, we might think of why not joining us there and, and have a further discussion like this. What are the next steps? What are the outcomes uh, from uh, your study? Uh, from uh, where do we stand with ours? And have a discussion involving, because we are aiming at a very large uh, meeting. And I think finding also maybe good examples we are all not aware of, that helps us to make more arguments. So I think the fact that we are in a dialogue, uh, I think it's, as it's a difficult topic, we can only solve it by, by uh, intensifying our dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, there is another question in our chat. Actually, uh, the question uh, comes to, to Johan Kuchuk, to me. Uh, you mentioned barriers to foundation across border uh, work, and we welcome that uh, uh, the Legal Affairs Committee report will review European status for association and foundations, as well other uh, organizations, MPOs. When do you expect uh, the report to be to be ready? In the past, there were issues related to a legal base of European uh, status because member states had to agree unanimously. Would the new approach consider uh, a, di a different uh, basis? Uh, certainly, we will uh, consider. We will consider all the all the opinions. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, we we carefully look to uh, uh, info and inputs uh, coming from uh, different uh, organizations. For us, they are all valuable, and we'll continue uh, cooperating and collaborating with uh, civil society organizations, but also. Uh, to, to, to form a, a good block of, uh, of, of people in the, in the House of uh, a European Democracy. And when I say House of European Democracy, certainly I mean European Parliament. And, and when it comes to the <clears throat> timing of the report, uh, the idea is to have a draft report, as I said, presented in April or May. Uh, you never know in, in times of, of COVID, of course, but uh, at least we, we want to be uh, much more ambitious. Uh, despite the COVID uh, uh, situation, uh, the, the requested uh, EPRS study is uh, on the potential benefits of a European legislative approach on associations and non-profit organizations compared to the current state of play and uh, should hopefully be ready uh, by, the, by the end of March. Through all your questions, they are all uh, very important uh, for sure. And uh, yes, uh, there is another one uh, asking uh, about uh, more uh, more clarity when it comes to registration uh, on on EU uh, scale. Would the existing similarities in the differentiated approach of the legal system uh, systems uh, sufficient uh, for such a harmonization, or an alternative approach should be look after? Uh, who wants to uh, respond to, to that question? Anna? Uh, 
I, I would love to answer this question, but I don't want you to say things that are uh, just to, to be able to talk. And I think it's a uh, very much deeper needed a legal uh, knowledge for that. My perspective is uh, is uh, is uh, from from um, uh, the civil society's perspective. I don't. I'm not a legal expert, so I, I would give you the option to to answer. I think you are better in that than me. All right, all right. If there is no uh, other interventions, uh, let me let me uh, thank you once again and try to conclude this uh, panel before uh, passing the floor uh, to to Nicola. Uh, as was pointed out throughout uh, discussion today, in 27 member uh, states, considerable differences can be found. With uh, with this sentence, I'm trying to answer uh, your question as well. Uh, with regard to the uh, regulatory frame, it's obvious. However, with the foundations, there are also important uh, similarities, which overall are more substantial than uh, uh, the remaining differences. It is now the question of uh, finding the right balance in the legislative work uh, to addressing the remaining questions and concerns and provide uh, for, for legal certainty. And with that, uh, I am going to pass the floor, uh, of course, by thanking you uh, once again uh, to, to Nicola uh, and to the second panel, where we'll be uh, hearing uh, about single market for uh, philanthropy uh, and uh, the different aspects of, um, of our uh, common work together with uh, Nicola and Anna, Anna in the future. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, I'm passing the floor all the to you. Thank you very much, Ilhan. Um, thank you, all the panelists, um, dear Commissioner, dear Margaret, dear colleagues. I'm so honored to see you all today. This means a lot to me, and this topic is very important to me. So I'm glad to have found so many allies, and I'm looking forward to make even more today. A big thank for, to our first panel. I think you managed it really well to give a profound insight into the diversity of the sector for public good, may it be a foundation, a civil society organization, or another, maybe new European form we want to have. This emphasizes, in my opinion, the benefits and so the need of a legal form for a European foundation. And I wish the best of success to my colleagues Ilhan and Anna that are working in the jury committee on this particular file. Let me be clear, even if we divided this event into two panels, to give you two angles on a broader issue, we are all here together for achieving the same goal, promoting philanthropy and enabling civil society actors to continue with their essential work for our society in and outside Europe. In our second panel, we want to go a bit more into the details of obstacles for philanthropy nowadays. We have heard about what a legal status for European foundations could bring us advantages and how it could facilitate their work. But we also want to know what we can do in addition or without touching the legal form aspect. And this is where I turn my head to my econ colleagues. I'm very, very much looking forward, particularly to what my former colleague, Margaret McGuinness, herself now commissioner for financial services, financial stability, as well as Ma Capital Markets Union has to say from the angle of the European Commission. I'm also curious to hear the input of my colleague, Luis Garicano, he himself, Renew Econ Coordinator. For us as liberals, the common market is clearly one of the key pillars of the European Union. It is one of the success stories of European Union, base of growth, jobs, wealth, so working for the society. But we as liberals have furthermore the conviction that the common market should not only be there for earning money, for enterprises, goods and services, but in same way for philanthropy, for the engagement from citizens to citizens. Of course, you may say, and we heard um, uh, already some of the examples, if the work of so many foundations and civil society organizations mitigated the crisis in pooling emergency funds, supporting research for, to fight the virus, virus, providing support to the most affected communities and demonstrating solidarity with wider civil society during 
the COVID-19 crisis, how can philanthropy potentially be blocked? It is. And we will later have a broader picture shown by Ludwig Forrest, head of international philanthropy of the King Baudouin Foundation, and by Sibylle Micheling of the Volkswagen Stiftung of the hurdles they have to take in real life. To begin with, institutional philanthropy in Europe includes more than 147,000 philanthropic organizations with an accumulated annual expenditure of nearly 60 billion euros. 60 billion euros. Imagine this potential. These organizations and donors, of course, work more and more across border and in collaboration with partners from all over Europe. Citizens move around Europe. They have assets and family members in different countries and show a growing appetite for collaboration on European issues. To implement their project, they need to move and operate freely across borders, as we could see that certain issues, like the corona crisis, do not stop at borders. But people still do not have the freedom to donate or give for public goods cross border as they should have. Besides the problem mentioned in the first panel, like unnecessary administrative barriers, some member states also have introduced new restrictions to foreign funding of philanthropic actors and wider, wider civil society actors that even get difficult from them to find formal banking channels to transfer philanthropic money across borders. There is also a problem with asset administration when it comes to supporting startups or social enterprises with social impact investments. Some national laws require preservation of the value of the endowment, even if philanthropic mission-related investment or invest prices do not always generate the required returns or are considered to risky investment. Some national laws do not permit the giving of loans by public benefit organizations or any other program activity that generates income on the program side. The most concerning issue, however, is the question of capital movement. Normally, it should be very simple. Capital flows for philanthropic purposes are covered by the treaty rules on free movement of capital. And the freedom of capital prohibits discrimination and foreign funding restrictions. But while it is easy for goods, services, and companies to move freely around in Europe, it is still difficult for donors, foundations, and committed citizens to act philanthropically across. Compared to companies that can move freely in the European single market, philanthropic organizations and philanthropic flows do not yet have a level playing field. Philanthropic actors do not get, yet enjoy the full freedoms with regards to taxation and suffer from an unfair VAT deal. According to the report on feasibility of European Foundation Statute by the European Foundation Center, the calculable cost of tax law barriers activities of European foundations range from an estimated 90 to 101 million per year. Even worse then, that some governments have not yet introduced the non-discrimination principle and the free flow of capital, but continue to discriminate comparable foreign EU-based public benefit organizations and their donors from local ones. There are still rules in place that provide that non-resident foundations are denied all or some tax benefits which domestic legislators have guaranteed to resident foundations. While almost all member states provide benefits for resident individuals or corporate donors who donate money to resident public benefit foundations, donations to non-resident public benefit foundations have traditionally often been excluded from these benefits. States that have formally removed discrimination and that allow member states to consider a foreign EU-based organization comparable to resident ones, though often provide for very complex rules and procedures. In my opinion, the mutual recognition of philanthropic status from one country in all the other member states' countries could be a simple and quick solution for ending discrimination and bureaucracy public good organizations. 
and it would help all foundations and organizations already existing without the need to change the legal form. And I'm optimistic that progress can be reached. One year ago, with our first event on this topic, we started with a small group of people, but maybe some of you will rem remember. But the awareness is growing and growing. And today, I am glad that finally my whole group is behind us. This is really wonderful, Ilhan. Now, also after the pandemic proved again the potential of public good, we have to follow up the progress. We need to take action and push for better conditions for a better work environment for foundations and civil society. Let us unlock this potential of public good and private resources for socially, environmentally, and economically resilient Europe. We must fight for a review and change of unjustified or unproportionate regulation. We still do not have effective policies at national and EU level to make sure that philanthropy can respond even more efficiently to future and current crises. For that purpose, we should promote an own initiative report in this field that could be called, for example, a single market for philanthropy. It shall ensure the free flow of capital within the internal market and the application of the non-discrimination principle to facilitate tax-effective cross-border philanthropy. The European Commission, dear Commissioner, should consider recommending guidance to the national level in terms of soft law approaches, at least issue guidance in terms of how national tax law rules could be simplified in the form of a code of conduct. Where national laws are not in line with EU law, such as the introduction of foreign funding restrictions in the middle of Europe in case of discrimination of foreign non-profit organizations and their donors, the European Commission is invited to issue tools to rectify such scenarios, for example, via infringement procedures. And talking to the Commission and all the ideas she should hopefully implement in the future, I am now passing the floor and the word to my wonderful former Vice President colleague, now Commissioner for Financial Services and Stability, as well the Capital Market Unit, Mydek McGuinness. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nicola and colleagues. Um, I've had the great benefit of listening to your presentation um, and I've learned a great deal from it and I was able to listen to some of the questions and answers here. So I'm very glad to be part of uh, this interesting uh, discussion today and about unleashing the potential of public good. And I think that's a concept that is coming more and more into the frame, uh, indeed, as we look to trying to recover from this pandemic. So a very good afternoon to all of you who are participating, particularly to my former colleague, Nicola, who I hope is still a colleague, and indeed Ilhan, um, and other colleagues who are online here. I know that Nicola, you have been talking about this for some time and indeed you've been taking action. So I applaud your work in this regard. It's a topic that's very close to the heart of everybody who's participating in this event today. And I, therefore I'm very happy to be here and to try and lay out the commission's perspectives and take on board some of the comments that already have been made. And as you're aware, my colleague, Commissioner Gentiloni, this is an area where he works in and we have worked well together in relation Relation to my contribution today. This pandemic has been difficult, not least its impact on public health, but also on our societies and of course on our economy. And governments have put in place an unprecedented support measures right across the European Union. But alongside all of that, we've seen a very significant social and community response from the very important gestures of people getting food and medication for older and more vulnerable neighbors communities setting up impromptu networks to support their more vulnerable members. And I think citizens have stepped up in terms of that solidarity, including in terms of private giving for those who have remained in employment. We've also witnessed the ability of philanthropic and non-profit organizations to respond quickly to some of the effects of the crisis, although they, like other organizations, have had a challenging year. I want to talk a little about the strong points of foundations and philanthropic organizations. These can help drive innovative approaches to issues from housing deprivation and homelessness, to migration and the inclusion of vulnerable groups, 
to environmental solutions for the green transition. These organizations are grounded in member states and are close to those in significant need. And at the same time, their work across member states can carry solidarity across borders. These organizations often operate in strategic and niche sectors, traditionally outside the remit of private financial institutions, and they focus on the long term. Their emphasis on impact over cost savings or profit can help reframe our focus on sustainable outcomes. Philanthropic resources and investments are a key part of the overall investment needed to meet the challenges we face, including the recovery, the green transition and socio-economic challenges. We're seeing more awareness of the role ph philanthropy can play in addressing social issues and advancing sustainability alongside the public sector. So partnerships with the sector can also help us as we look towards building a sustainable recovery. However, philanthropic organizations can face difficulties in trying to take full advantage of the single market. Today, I want to introduce what the Commission is doing to engage with the sector and create an enabling environment in which philanthropy can thrive. So the steps we're taking. The Commission recognizes the value of engaging with philanthropy in a number of areas, but there are still a number of issues around the European single market for philanthropy and foundations. The foundations face many barriers. I think this has already been referenced. For example, if they want to operate across borders within the European Union, and some of these barriers are the recognition of public benefit foundations across borders, tax effective giving, and cross-border investments. A key challenge is the lack of a common legal status for foundations. And the commission has undertaken several initiatives to overcome some of these barriers but these have not always been as successful as we would have hoped. But we have a number of relevant EU policy programs where we are involving the philanthropic sector. The Invest EU program, part of Next Generation EU Recovery Package, will provide a number of opportunities for foundations to act as partners and co-investors with the EU budget to develop an ecosystem for social investment. The aim is to help investments with impact to get off the ground and support market development in the social sector. Potential actions under InvestEU, including de-risking mechanisms to reorientate investment capital from the large asset basis of foundations towards sustainable areas, aligning with the mission of these organizations. Foundations and philanthropic organizations are involved also in projects that are part of the Horizon program. And their involvement is foreseen in our recent media action plan and the Integration and Inclusion Action Plan. Philanthropy is part of the European social economy, and social economy is included as one of the 14 industry ecosystems in the new EU industrial strategy and recovery plan. These developments open important new pathways for further improving the environment for cross-border philanthropy. As you're aware, in 2012, the Commission proposed a European Foundation Statute as part of the first EU social business initiative to support collaboration and the internationalization of philanthropic activities. This proposal did not survive, but given the current context of the recovery and changing public priorities, there may be a new momentum to explore policy solutions for more effective cross-border donations, investments, and philanthropic activities. The Commission is committed to a level playing field for organizations in the SIGAN market. Donations in general are already covered by the treaty rules on free movement of capital, which create rights both for the donor and the recipient of the donation. As guardian of the treaty, the Commission may take action to tackle national measures that unduly restrict the cross-border movement of capital. And the Commission is reflecting on how to further support an enabling environment for cross-border philanthropy with greater private contributions for public benefit causes and broader civic engagement. Ensuring a truly European space for donors where philanthropy can make full use of the benefits of the single market is a priority for two important reasons. First, a key aspect of our investment policy is how to enable those addressing complex issues to access the capital they need. As I mentioned, some solutions are already being explored under InvestEU 
we need to pay closer attention to the ability of organizations to support charitable projects with cross-border donations while ensuring bureaucracy is kept to a minimum with equal tax treatment. It should also be possible to merge foundations across border and make capital work together for a common objective. Now, secondly, to support solidarity and equality, we need to encourage private giving. We want to encourage generosity and active citizenship and allow more people to do more good more easily. A possible way to do this could be a parallel form of foundation with common recognition by member states, ensuring smart stewardship and the effective channeling of resources. This year, Commission services working on the social economy and other actions related to the European pillar of social rights will be looking at these questions to help us create a fair and resilient future. We should be looking to build a fair, social and sustainable Europe as we rebuild after this crisis. And I firmly believe that philanthropic and non-profit organizations can help us get there with your help to enable them to take full advantage of the single market. Thank you for sparking this debate and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, dear Commissioner, for your input. Uh, and um, a lot of actions under the way um, from the Commission. We're really looking for your support for this important question and be aware that the European Parliament, that we as a group promoting philanthropy and single market, will support your actions so that you can be more successful than in 2012. I mean, yes, it was a pity that we were not successful this, that, that year, but maybe we can be successful this year. And to see what is important to that, I pass now on the mic to um, Mr. Ludwig Forrest, Head of International Philanthropy by the King Baudouin Foundation. Uh, it's really good to have you once again, I can say, here on the panel to give us a deep insight in the real life of a foundation working cross-border and the hurdles and how we can go over those hurdles. Thank you to be with us. But thank you for the invitation, of course. Uh, it's always a pleasure and an honor for me to share views on cross-border giving and cross-border philanthropy. I had only one thank you to start this, my speech, but since I'm listening to all the previous speakers, I really have three more and many others. The first one is to, to, to thank you for the extremely good understanding of the issue. Uh, what has been said until today, I can only agree and, and, and thank you for that. Also, thank you for the recognition of the role of philanthropy. Uh, you have stated it many times and it's important for the sector, for the philanthropic sector to be, to be recognized. And also thank you for the solutions you are uh, proposing and promoting since months now, uh, but that were highlighted again today. Yes, cross-border giving should be improved, enabled or facilitated. You may, you may choose. In fact, it is a low hanging fruit. The, you said it yourself. Um, the issue should not be an issue anymore. Cross-border giving flows do fall under the non-discrimination principle, under the free movement of capital. We are all convinced and of justice as recognized years ago. But still, cross-border giving remains complicated, burdensome and costly. I will dig into examples because sometimes real life is also important to, to, to help you to understand what we are talking about. Um, the first would be that we have, and you said it yourself, donors are living abroad, marrying abroad, working abroad, retiring abroad. And we have tenants that want to support their university where they studied. But obviously this university is not always in the same country where they live. We have hundred thousands of people that want to support opera houses, art uh, performances, museums, places that they visited, uh, beautiful places that they visited all over Europe and they don't want to be hampered by, by borders. Also, we have more and more donors that want to support climate uh, organizations, research organizations, and all these should be helped and enabled. And then I speak speak about lifetime donations, but you have many persons that want to do bequests, that want to reserve part of or all their requests to support charitable causes all over Europe. So it is for these people that we are doing all this. 
Next example, companies. Um, companies having employees and business units all over Europe and that do uh, launch solidarity funds and that do invite their shareholders, their employees, their clients, their business units to contribute to these solidarity funds that after that will help organizations all over Europe. They also would like to do it in a very easy and effective way and sometimes they just don't know how to start with it. Um, a global philanthropic movement. At the King Baudouin Foundation, we are hosting the Common Goal Fund that was launched by a German social entrepreneur and by Juan Mata, a football player uh, playing at Manchester United. This Juan Mata has done a pledge. I give 1% of my revenues to support projects all over Europe and in the world that support football as a force for good, that promote social cohesion by football, through football. So he said, I'm doing it myself, but I will also speak to my female colleague players and my male colleague players all over Europe. Dear players, can you do this pledge? So what was the, 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 what was the difficulty here? It was to find a solution that allowed the Italian player to make a tax deductible donation, the German player, the, um, the, the, the Swedish player, the Portuguese player, the Italian player, the Spanish player, and so on and so on, to allow this to make very effective tax deductible donations to support this effort. And you can imagine that we are speaking about uh, high potentials here. And then you said it already as well, we have the COVID-19, the reaction last year of donors. And again, thank you for the recognition of the role, but indeed we saw that philanthropists, big and small, were very mature. They didn't hesitate long. They understood that they had to react immediately in niches, to do uh, with, with a lot of agility and in a complementary way, in a humble but complementary way to what the, the governments and what the EU institutions did to help us to go through this crisis. So this was very important. We, the King Baudouin Foundation, how are we dealing with this issue? The King Baudouin Foundation, obviously we are recognized in Belgium, logic. But then we said, okay, we receive donations out of other countries, what will we do? In some countries, like in the Netherlands and in Denmark, we did register. We were approved by the Danish authorities and by the, the Dutch authorities. It took us time and efforts and, and, and so on, but still, we did it. In France, we were not approved, we were agreed. Um, also, we had the pleasure and honor to be agreed by Bercy, but this also, it took us uh, efforts finances, we had to work with, with advisors and so on to achieve this. And in Luxembourg, we did benefit from the very liberal position of Luxembourg uh, concerning cross-border philanthropy. But in other countries like Italy, Spain and so on, we couldn't do this effort in the 27, 28 other European countries. So we, we launched years ago, we launched a transnational giving Europe network, which is a private solution that facilitates cross-border philanthropy already, but this is not sufficient, of course. So um, really, if we want to allow philanthropy to play this complementary, but growing an important role, we should take action. And we all said it, we should push this status, this status that we tried, but that maybe there is now a new opportunity to do it. We should urge and help mem and help very important to say also help member states to, to ease comparability tests, to allow, to compare organizations, to allow them to benefit from the same tax benefits while receiving donations, to write maybe a code of, con of, of conduct or to promote the best in class member states like Luxembourg, like the Netherlands. And we should also continue to support uh, the, 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 the private initiatives that show the way, but again, that are not sufficient. So. My last, I said I have many thank yous since the beginning of, 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 of these two hours. My last thank you will go to, 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 to you all for continuing to consider this issue and to encourage you to find the right solutions to allow Europeans to demonstrate their active citizenship by doing good and better philanthropy. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Forrest, for your really engaged intervention. 
And we pass now uh, over to Sibylle Michelling uh, from the Volkswagen Stiftung for her insight on the real life of a foundation in, in Europe. Thank you that you are with us. Yes, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy and delighted to, to speak today to you. And yes, I'd like to talk about the experience of um, the Volkswagen Stiftung or Volkswagen Foundation um, with regard to cross-border investments and especially with regard to the hurdles and obstacles we, um, yes, we have to deal with. Uh, per, let me uh, introduce a little, just a little bit the Volkswagen uh, Foundation to you. We are Germany's largest uh, private research funding foundation. Um, our overall funding volume is around 150 million euros per year. And our foundation's assets uh, amount to about three and a half billion. And because I'm speaking um, of cross-border investments, uh, just a few words to our investments. Um, approximately 40% of uh, our investments are equities. And a good two-fifths of the equities we have invested into Eurozone countries. And the situation in Germany is that German public benefit organizations are generally exempt from German income and corporation. But uh, speaking of hurdles and obstacles, even in Germany for a German uh, foundation, we have had a deterioration of the legal situation starting last year. Um, this um, regards to dividends, which uh, NGO, German NGOs receive uh, by German corporations. Uh, since last year, 15% uh, of tax is withheld on these dividends and we have to meet certain criteria in order to claim back the tax amounts. Until the year 2019, there have never been any uh, withholdings on German dividends. And so even in the home country, our situation has been um, yeah, deteriorated. Uh, I'm quite sure that we will get the money back from the German fiscal authorities, but I'm not sure about how long it will take. And just a small anecdote, there is not yet a form for getting the money back. Nobody at the German financial authority, which is responsible for us, knows how to do it exactly. So the legislation was quicker than the administration. But yes, uh, mainly I would like to speak about cross-border uh, procedures and hurdles. Um, and I only want to speak about dividend income because we do not have any problems with regard to interest income because uh, there is no tax deductions on this within Europe. We have uh, filed refund claims for deducted withholding tax in eight e, um, European states. That means in Belgium, Finland, France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Spain. And there are three countries Finland, Ireland, and the Netherlands have always and fully settled our claims so that we got the deducted tax back in full. But the other countries have either totally or partially rejected our claims, or the claims are still pending. So there has not yet a decision been made. Um, in our opinion, there are the following three main problems and obstacles for foreign NGOs. 
the first one, um, it has been mentioned before. Um, I would like to perhaps make some repetitions. Um, I would like to state that there are no standard requirements for the recognition of ND NGOs as comparable to those in the relevant country. Um, there are some countries and the best example for me or for our foundation is the Netherlands where the process of getting the deducted text back is very straightforward and quick. There is very, very, there's only few documents which we will have to provide and we do not need a tax advisor. Our uh, depository bank can file the claims and we get our money back within a few uh, months. So no problem at all. Uh, but unfortunately, in most other countries, the supporting documentation uh, required is huge. And many documents have to be translated into the national language. And that concerns especially France, Italy, and Spain. We have to translate everything. And sometimes, and that makes it more expensive, the, the process. And sometimes we even have to get documents certified by a public notary, which makes the process even more difficult. Yes, um, the second point I would like to make concerns the high costs we have to incur for refund claims um, because the requirements are often, yes, quite considerable. It's necessary for us to involve specialized tax consultants. And the Volkswagen Foundation works together with a big German tax firm, um, and which has partners of the same network in many European countries. It's not possible to get um, claims filed without tax consultants in the relevant countries, in, in our opinion. And we only make claims when the tax amounts are rather large and the potential refund amounts exceed the estimated costs distinctively. And so for us, because we are quite a big foundation, it's possible to incur those costs. But I think smaller foundations um, with smaller amounts of tax are excluded from tax refunds, yes, simply because of the high costs for, for filing the claims. And yeah, uh, speaking a little bit more about costs, the cost ratios vary from country to country and the higher the prospective refund amounts, the better the relation between costs and proceeds. Um, yes, uh, we have started with our um, claims uh, after the Staufer decision in the year 26. And from this year until now, we have uh, received refunds from different countries of about 5.9 million euros. And we have incurred costs for this of about 1.2 million euros. So this brings us to an overall expense ratio of a little bit more than 20%. So it's possible for us, but the costs are high and, and I have not yet and also taken into account the considerable amount of staff time because yes, sometimes I have to spend Yes, sometimes a, a day or one or two days of a week just for yeah, uh, dealing with those refund procedures in different countries. And yes, the third and last point I'd like to make concerns the length of time until the refund or the final rejection of claims. The time period from filing of a claim until either the refund or the final rejection is very 
uh, differs a lot. And in some European countries, this period is especially long. And here I have to uh, mention Italy, unfortunately, just to give you an example. We have filed our earliest claims in the year 2007, the latest in 2015. And the first react reaction of the Italian fiscal authorities came only in 2017. That means 10 years after submission of the first claims. Uh, we have not got any reaction with, uh, in the, uh, yes, in, for 10 years. And then all claims have been uh, rejected in full. And meanwhile, we have started litigation and the good news is that we have one and two court instances, but we will have to enter into the third and final instance soon. That will be the Supreme Court in Italy because um, the, uh, the Italian fiscal authorities have given notice of appeal upon each court decision in favor of Volkswagen Foundation. So we don't know yet how much time and cost it will take to deal with the third and last yeah, instance, court instance. Um, to be fair, in other countries, it's quicker than in Italy. In France, perhaps five to six years, it, it differs a lot. <laughs> but in, in, in Finland, uh, perhaps only one or two years, it's very, very dif uh, different. So to come uh, to the end of my little speech, in our view, it would help NGOs very much if there would be standard and uniform regulations within the European Union with regard to the criteria for the recognition of NGOs as comparable to those in the relevant country. And these criteria should be few and practicable. Practicable, yes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Smitscherling. Um, it's really uh, important to see what the concrete real hurdles uh, on the ground are. And I mean, you already pointed out, you are a big foundation, so you can deal with this problem. You have a team, um, you have the time and you have the money. Um, a lot of foundations will give up in such a process, whether it is for five years or 10 years, I think it shouldn't leave uh, normally not five months uh, to do so. Uh, it should be really more, um, uh, it should be really easier to do it. And so I pass on to Luis Garicano, my sheer colleague uh, from the Econ Committee. He is coordinator of our Renew Europe group um, and really engaged. And he will speak on the benefits of foundation during COVID-19 pandemic uh, using the example of Spain. And as Spain was already mentioned, dear Luis, uh, then the floor is yours and you can just take the mic on from um, Ms. Michelin um, uh, on those practical Example. Thank you, uh, Nicola. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, it was very interested by the by the by the comments, concrete comments by Frau Michelin and, and Mr. Forrest. Uh, it was really really interesting to hear uh, concrete ideas. You know, I mean, I think as as as, as a renew vice president and colleague of Nicola, um, I mean, we are very aware that 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 we are sitting in the middle of the spectrum. There are the the left uh, wants everything to be done by the state, the compulsion, obligation, taxes, and and the, the, the market loving right uh, sometimes just prefer prices and individual uh, profit motive. And they all forget that there is something in between that is very important. And, and, and COVID shows us how important is civil society, community, people voluntarily joining uh, to, to help and, and, and to, to do something philanthropic. And, and I want to really, in that sense, thank uh, Nicola uh, for, for leading this, this view that Europe should be much more present in this area. And hearing you, I mean, I can see more than ever how important it is that, that Europe takes action here. And, and I will offer my 100% my, my, my heartfelt support to Nicola in this. And indeed, philanthropic uh, foundation sector have been very quick to, to respond to COVID. 
there has been a hole. Neither the market nor the state were ready, and foundations were ready to to really help help out. And and this third sector has been has been fundamental in pulling emergency funds, uh, in helping to mitigate crisis. Let me just give you three quickly three examples. I'm not going to talk too long. Just to say. Uh, they've helped individuals to manage the, the COVID aid. Uh, there was a, a, a non-contributive social security benefit uh, for for uh, for Spaniards passed in May 2020. But for those who were poor, uh, but accessing it requires a, a whole administrative process that Ms. Mrs. Michelering can can imagine how it's going to work. So so um, foundations uh, were set up and 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 help people beneficiaries process requests and therefore their work has been essential to help them. Um, there were tablets for the digital and social uh, gap. The Spanish Association of Foundations gave 5,000 tablets donated by Indra uh, with 3,000 cards donated by Telefonica, Orange, and Vodafone to, to, uh, through 28 foundations so that uh, kids could actually attend school. Um, many beneficiaries had lost contact with their educational institutions through the pandemic, so that was also very useful. Uh, another collaborative project, the last one, is that uh, there's the joins those that help campaign, the Unitelos que ayudan. Again, many foundations helping uh, together families that were left without livelihood for lack of income or resources, homeless people uh, that could that could not comply with the safety measures that were decreed by the government, other people who lived alone and needed uh, access to basic services. The campaign brought together uh, at the worst moment of the pandemic, many, many relevant en entities and, and really managed to, to have a big impact. Um, the Madrid Food Bank, the Red Cross, the uh, Balia Foundation, the Gypsy Secretary Foundation, Save the Children, they were all involved. So I think that the, the COVID crisis, in some sense, I mean, it's a terrible, horrible crisis, but in some sense, can help us give impulse to, to this effort that is lead, being led by Nicola to, to solve these this, this problems that uh, both uh, Mr. King uh, and uh, and Frau Michelin have pointed out uh, foundations want to keep growing. They want to unlock the, the more the, the the philanthropy that is there waiting. Um, the university people that uh, Ludwig Forest King mentioned the the, the, the Ludwig, Ludwig Forest. Sorry, I'm, I'm calling you Mr. King. I'm so sorry uh, that that Mr. Forest uh, mentioned uh, the the. Uh, Football idea. I'm, I'm for sure going to borrow that idea, uh, Mr. Forrest, for the Spanish press, the Juan Mata, uh, not being able to, to to coordinate this this complicated tax issue. So I think there are two issues that you mentioned, and the two issues I think should be at the forefront of our initiative. One is removing barriers within EU countries and between EU countries um, to facilitate cross-border philanthropy across the EU. Uh, in the same way as we have freedom of capital, we should have a good environment for for cross-border philanthropy. It's it's really vital in, in this in these moments. And I think societies should see those those synergies between countries right now as really crucial. The second point that uh, you ha have mentioned that I could not agree more is we need uh, the tax rules. I mean right now the the Spanish government indeed is asking companies as as uh, as, as you both know directly is asking foundations to show Incorporated in Spain and the Spanish companies, etc., in order to really get the tax benefits, which is which is really uh, very uh, discouraging the cross-border financial. So I think um, we've been talking about uh, code of conduct and list of recognized entities, uh, other soft law approaches. I don't think it's enough. I don't think soft law is enough, but it is a start, and we have to use any possible tool to 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 use this impulse from COVID to really get uh, this sector uh, where it should be at the European level. I wanted to say just that you count on your support, that Nicola counts with, with all our support, and that I will be there to, to, to help her spearhead this, this, spearhead this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, we come to the Q&A um, um, phase uh, in our event. So you can already um, put um, questions to our panelists in the Q and A uh, session uh, part in uh, on the on the website. Um, to start, maybe uh, Mr. Forrest, often in the discussion, or maybe also uh, Ms. Michelin, 
Um, often in the discussion, um, the topic of fighting against money laundering, corruption, um, is used as an argument against a freer flow cross border uh, of um, money donations from foundations. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Why this, in, I suppose, uh, in your opinion, um, this shouldn't be um, the reason um, to overstep. Uh, we are all against money laundering, corruption uh, in the different European countries and even outside Europe, uh, European Union. Uh, why this is uh, already um, taken on board from other parts of your work uh, and not the problem uh, which you have to, to face for the moment. Yes, maybe Sibyl, if you allow, I will, I will start by, 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 by answering this very important question. Indeed, we are all against money laundering. And so you probably are aware of all the efforts that uh, is done by the different umbrella organizations like the European Foundation Center, like Daphne, but also for associations too to highlight this risk and to ask to their members, uh, by also by the national federations of foundations, to, uh, to ask to their members to be uh, very transparent uh, and very aware of this, this, this potential, uh, potential problems. So there are internal rules at King Baudouin Foundation. We obviously have internal rules. When we accept, when we meet donors and when we accept donations and at the Belgian Federation of Foundations, there are also rules and at the European Foundation Center, there are rules plus all the necessary steps that we are doing to continue to be approved by the Belgian government. So um, the sector is aware, the sector is always happy to, 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 to learn together with the national and European institutions to see how we can combat together this issue. But the sector is also asking for a proportionate approach. Um, you, cannot, you cannot block everything because of a risk, uh, of, of, of a risk that we are aware of. So, so if we can move with this proportionate approach, uh, we can, I'm sure, finding solution that uh, the enormous majority of, of, of things that are done with, with sincere reasons, with the heart, for the common good, should not be impeded by small, uh, well, by, by trial, try, by, by people that try to misuse uh, potential good, good decisions. Thank you, Ms. Mitchelling. Maybe you also can say what is the key point in the litigation you have with Italian state? Uh, why not recognizing that you are uh, from the philanthropy sector? I mean, I can ex I can understand that no state government wants really to give back taxes, and as you are investing a lot, uh, a big sum, so there will be also a big revenue one to put it back into philanthropy. So into a good uh, which is public and which helps uh, in innovation, in research or whatever. So in society, so this is money going back to society. What is the point the Italian government is fighting about um, not to give you the back the money for the public good? Uh, yes, one of the main points is that the Italian financial authorities say that we do not actively um, pursue public benefit um, activities directly in Italy. They think we should do this in Italy, perhaps mainly or to a great extent. And this is one key point. And there's others as well, like, like in Italy, there's certain criteria for Italians and, and it's not, and the, legal situation of each country is different. So sometimes it's not possible to fulfill exactly each requirement that an Italian or other um, foundation has to fulfill. But um, the main problem right now is that we do not, according to the Italian financial authorities, do not uh, fund, give enough money uh, to Italian um, scientific organizations. And okay. other countries who do not want to pay 
the money back say we are not registered in a German foundation registry because perhaps in another country there is such a national registry of NGOs or foundations, but we do not have such a registry registry yet in Germany. There's an initiative, uh, a legal initiative to make some changes in German law, but it's not yet um, ready or, or finalized. So sometimes there is formal arguments just in order to fend off the claims. And I have been told that Germany is not better than other countries. We are not very, um, yeah, mm, we are a country which does much to in order to not pay back taxes as well. So I don't, because I don't want to give the impression that other uh, European countries uh, put up hurdles. It's Germany as well, as I have been told from other uh, foundations from abroad. Thank you very much. And we have a question to Luis Garricano in the, um, as he Rapporteur on AML issues, how can it be ensured that well-intended AML policies has no unintended consequences on the public benefit and philanthropy sector, and that some governments are even using AML policies to close civil society space? This is a question from Hannah Schurmatz from Daphne. This is a very, very, very good question. And it's a question that is very hard. I think that Ms. Forrest uh, said, said it right. We have to, we have to find, uh, we have to find a, a path in the middle. We, we are, um, Renew has a huge, huge priority on, on AMLs. Um, we, are, we are very much wanting to fight any money laundering. Um, I think the key issue for us is beneficial ownership registries. I am very, partial to knowing who is the ultimate beneficiary in, uh, in financial transactions. And I think whether these are um, for profit or not for profit, this is at the end, you need to know who is behind it. I think that's, that's key. Thank you very much. And maybe another question to our dear commissioner. Um, how do you think after hearing all those uh, examples from the crowd, uh, will it really be possible um, to have at least guidelines? So coming on by soft law to go further uh, on this way uh, to a better situation for philanthropy and the real single market also for civil, uh, civil uh, society. Is she still connected or not? I don't see her in the list right now. I see. Ah, okay. Maybe she has a problem on that. <laughs> no, no problem. Good. Okay. Um, then we maybe go further. You have a last chance to put your um, questions to our panelists um, in, in the uh, topic. Um, on a common single market, I think we, we saw really um, the uh, potential we could uh, enable to do again more engagement for our societies cross border. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the examples we heard uh, that this money, of course, it, it stays somewhere, <laughs> it doesn't go to philanthropy and normally should be. Uh, going there because the donors wanted it to go there and not to administration cost um, to uh, legal advisors uh, or to a court system uh, being judges paid by. Um, so obviously there are no more um, no more questions in the chat. So um, it's my part to thank you very much, uh, Ilhan. You uh, maybe uh, want also have some including remarks, but I was I will give it first to, to Anya, ladies first, uh, to some conclusion remarks. You were on the first panel. You um, saw that your question also on the legal statute were also mixed in um, the question. We were discussed also on the second panel, showed a little bit up how we can easy, ease the way and environment for working conditions um, without having this huge project of new legal statute. So Anna, 
um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think there is a lot being said. I think it was a really verse of two hours to spend together. Uh, as a closing remarks, I think I could just finish with one sentence. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, it was obvious that it's a, it's a complex topic because of the diversity, legal basis, but also because of uh, the urgency. Um, for me, the main message maybe is the sector is really diverse and we must find answers that address these diverse needs. Uh, therefore, if I can conclude, I think we must do three things. We must uh, finally break down the national constraints to allow civil society to flourish at the European level. We must overcome the burdens coming from uh, varying national regulations that blocks civil society organizations growth at uh, European level. And we must boost cross-border donations. Uh, but I think in the meantime, we must uh, remind ourselves that throughout Europe, civil society organizations uh, report shrinking civic space, uh, whether direct attack like in Hungary or less direct and conscious attacks as well. So while thinking about their ability to grow cross-border, we must threaten EU protection against attacks on freedom of association, uh, expression and peaceful assembly so that civil society organizations space to cooperate is safeguarded and that their funding is not invested fighting shrinking sp civic space but on extra progress for benefits for all uh, and I think uh, what we really have to put uh, forward is, um, is, is that we have to be sure that uh, our voice is heard. And I, I really believe that this voice is going to be heard in a, in a real decision-making level when, when we are talking the same language uh, together. So as I said before, we must speak with one voice, uh, MEPs, NGOs, associations, foundations, and all civil society really want to thank all uh, the panelists from the civil society and the philanthropic organization for being with us. Uh, for sure that I learned a lot and there's, uh, there's even more work that I can bring forward so we can fight together too. Actually, next time we meet, we can say that we succeeded. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Ilhan, the floor is yours. What are thank you, you Nicola. on the topic? Yes. Thank you. It was, it was great. And um... As uh, I was pointed out uh, a number of times, uh, the course of today's discussion that uh, philanthropic organizations were able to organize quickly and play their role um, during uh, the, the ongoing pan pandemic is, is really important. Uh, the current circumstances indeed made the role of uh, philanthropy more visible than before, but also the pan-European hurdles which philanthropic organizations uh, meet. The difficulties to overcome are, are, are not minor. However, however it, uh, uh, if we want to develop the, the full potential of uh, philanthropy, we need to continue to push for more, more, for more legal uh, clarity. And uh, uh, an ecosystem for, for social investment, making full use of uh, European uh, single market. I welcome the commitment of the commission uh, one more time to develop an EU action plan on uh, social economy, and I'm convinced that working uh, in cooperation, we would be able to find uh, balance and unworkable solutions uh, uh, together with you, with Anna and, uh, and Luis, but also uh, I'm sure that we will be able to find more and more friends uh, when it comes to, to our calls. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ilhan. Thank you, Anna. And thank for all the speakers on our panel in those two hours of the intense the discussion. Uh, a special thank you also for all the representatives of the Commission, um, Commissioner McGuinness, but also from the DG Growth, Dr. Engelmann. Um, we are very looking forward to your report uh, on the survey of, of the situation of civil society and uh, philanthropy in the European Union. And we really hope that we can take action on this ground to um, make it easier uh, to invest in public goods, cross-border and within Europe to help our societies, because it will be those society who built up after the pandemic. They, saw, they, they showed already solidarity they have a really engaged voice in that, and we shouldn't have um, administrative tax burden um, to them. And so we really hope for your engagement on this. 
Uh, I was really optimistic to hear the commissioner speaking, really to have an eye on equal tax treatment, on having um, an eye on a good cross-border flow also for donations and uh, social investment, and that she wants to motivate the civil society. So we will give her full support uh, and uh, her colleagues in the College of the Commission um, thank you very much for this discussion today. It was the next step on our way into a single market for philanthropy, um, through a single market for the civil society. I think this should be the most priority in European Union. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Nicola.